Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. I am Ying, uh, the training coordinator of the academic training program at OKU. Um, so, uh, Oxford University Clinical Research Units Open Day. I will brief up some words on the about the event and the agenda of this afternoon. So, OKU organize other event every year to update and introduce you about what we are doing and especially the PT scholarship uh, program um, would maybe of your interest. Our crew were established 33 years ago in the co uh, collaboration with the hospital for tropical DC in Ho Chi Minh City and the very first featured the malaria research unit. Over the time, we have uh, developed significantly. Now, OCRU have a 10 research uh, group, uh, some other uh, supporting departments. We have a uh, sister units in uh, Jakarta and Nepal. Um, so we, 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 we work mainly on biomedical research, clinical trials, and relevant research field in collaboration with the Hospital for Tropical Disease in Ho Chi Minh City and the national one in Hanoi. Um, we, we, we want to have a, a positive impact on uh, global health, especially in the um, prevention, diagnosis, treatment for tropical disease, infectious disease uh, in Vietnam and in the regions. So alongside uh, doing research, we prioritize and focus on um, building capacity for local human resource. We offer opportunities for young researchers in Vietnam, Indonesia, Nepal, um, through a PhD uh, training program for international uh, research degree. So for next slide. So about um, this afternoon, um, the agenda will be uh, as first, uh, we will uh, invite you to join us for a virtual tour around Okru uh, units. Uh, then uh, Dr. Lee Jones, um, the uh, uh, regional academic training leader of Okru and Okru, will present and provide you full information of the BD scholarship program. After her presentation, we the representatives uh, from Okru research groups will uh, showcase the overall of their research, um, of their uh, groups, uh, works and uh, study projects. We will have uh, ten minutes for question and answer. Following. During that time, you have a chance to vote for your favorite research field. Then we will show you a video, a soft video introduced about Okru culture and training. At the end, the two junior uh, BAT students, uh, Mr. Hân Ngọc Tuyên from Modeling Group and uh, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Hoa from Okru Hanoi, will tell you uh, their story of um, how they get the way to work their BAT journeys. Um, we have uh, some some time for question and answer again at the end, but we will uh, close at 4 p.m. So with a uh, large audience um, for an online event like this, um, I would like you to help us just mute uh, your mic during the talks. If you have a question, you can drop in the chat box or you can raise your hand and raise your voice uh, in the question and answer session. In case your question in the chat box is not answered, maybe it will float it. Um, please email us uh, later. We have the training email that you can see on the um, flyer uh, on our media uh, social chain channel. Um, I hope you will enjoy this webinar. So now it's time for you to tour our crew site. Hi everyone, my name is Lee Jones. I'm the Regional Academic Training Leader at Okru and Moru, our sister unit in Thailand. Thank you, Ian, for the kind in invitation and thank you for the introduction to this year's Open Day. So as mentioned by Ian, I'd like to start by showing you a short video, a virtual tour of Okru 
um, across all of our units in the region. Enjoy. Hey, Chi. Hey, Guy. Good to see you. Where are we right now? So we're at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. So what's so special about this place? The Hospital for Tropical Diseases is a 550-bed hospital just for infectious diseases. It's probably one of the largest infectious disease hospitals in the world. And? And it's where Oak Root is. So come with me. Wow, that's a huge building. What's in here? So this is Okru. This is Okru's home. There are about 300 people working in, in here. We're part of the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. Let's go. Hey, Yui. Hi. What are you up to? Uh, I'm doing some DNA extraction for Klebsiella and pneumonia uh, for whole genome sequencing. That's what is resistant to um, Cap-Bevenems and Colistin. That's we collected from the Harvest for Tropical Diseases. So this is the enemy really, isn't it? And I think it's, re it's really useful to have a look at the enemy in the eye every morning, don't you think? Yeah, this is true enemy. This is my motivation for my research, and that's why I have spent so many years to try to understand them. Are there any machines to help improve the efficiency of your work? Well, there are, yes, and that's whole genome sequencing. So I think we should go and have a look at that, uh, that facility now. Should we go, Yui? Yeah, sure. Let's go. Morning in progress. So Yui, this is one of our MySeq Illumina sequences. What are, what are you doing with it here? So I'm uh, working on a whole genome sequencing of Klebsiella pneumonia. So not only is we are doing the sequencing for drug resistant bacteria, but also for emerging viruses, uh, viruses as well. Yeah, so those two things are really important for Oakley's research. So emerging infectious diseases, drug resistant infections, and the ability to sequence is really, really important to be able to understand how the, the bugs cause disease, but also how they spread around the communities. I've heard that there are some really special labs here at Oku. There are. There's the Biosafety Level 3 laboratory and the SAPO 4 laboratory. Some of the only labs like this in Vietnam, so we ought to go and have a look at them. Wow, this looks like a highly secure place. So what really goes on in here? So this is for very dangerous pathogens and for dangerous animal viruses. And there really aren't any laboratories like this in the rest of the country. Hmm. Can we go in? No, you can't go in there, I'm afraid. You've got to have special training to be able to get in there, which is something that Oku invests a lot of time in doing. Since we are in a hospital, do these research go to the field? There's a really strong link between these laboratories and the hospital. The labs are here because of the patients. So at this point, I think we need to go and speak to Dr. Ian and see the hospital. Hi, Dr. Ian. Hi. Tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, I am Lâm Minh Yên. I have been working with Emerging Infection Group of Ukru from 2016. So where are we now? Oh, uh, now I am in front of ICU Department of Hospital for Tropical Disease. Can we go in and take a look? Uh, not before you get the proper protection. Uh, Dr. Quang Minh will show you inside in the ICU. Are there any new features being added to the ICU recently? So Ugru provide a wearable machine where so we can monitor the patient and uh, many modern ICU beds. In the COVID-19 pandemic, many Ugru professors still give us some idea about the treatment for the patients. They still organize many case report presentations with us. They still have us with doing some research from the data in the computer. So Opro is still a very important collaborator with us. Is this the same impact across the country and region? Uh, yes, oh, so you can talk with the, my colleague in National Hospital for Tropical Disease. <laughs> hey, 
Hey Thomas, you look all wrapped up. Yes, it's winter here in the north. Does that increase the incidence of infectious disease? It does. The cold and humid weather favors the respiratory tract infections. So there are more community acquired pneumonia in the hospital these days. And also people take more antibiotics. So it's the high season for antimicrobial resistance. So tell us more about Oku Hanoi. We are located in the National Hospital of Tropical Diseases on the premises of Batmai Hospital together with other specialized hospitals. Where else does Oku Hanoi have footprints in? We have three sites. Two are in the NHTD, one in the city center here, one more in the north. This one in the north actually serves currently as a COVID-19 treatment center and it also holds the ultra-built National Reference Lab for Antimicrobial Resistance. The third side is NIHE, the National Institute of Hygiene and Epidemiology. All right. Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam. That's where all the decisions are made and where all the politicians are. And we felt it was important for our research to have a presence here in, uh, in Hanoi to be able to work with national hospitals, uh, with national public health institutes, and to have a proximity to the Ministry of Health and to policymakers there. Wow, that's really impressive. Thank you. Yeah, actually, the unique thing about uh, Okro Hanoi is that we have clinical research at the hospital, we have lab-based research, we have the epidemiology, and we have the public health arm. So what do you guys focus on here? Our research activities range from improving surveillance, improving diagnostic, to designing control intervention for hospitals, but also for the community. We also have some whole genome sequencing of multidrug-resistant bacteria, like, for example, you have here some results of a cluster of resistance Neisseria gonorrhea that has been identified in Vietnam. Oh, are the research conducted only in the cities? Not all of them. We also work in the rural areas in collaboration with the provincial CDCs, for example, in Nam Dinh and Hanam province. Is the situation different in the south of Vietnam than in the north? There are some uh, cultural and behavioral differences indeed, but it's certainly not as diverse as what you can see in Indonesia, for example. Maybe Kevin can tell you more about it. Hey Kevin, this building looks historic. What's the story here? It's a great story. This is the Eichmann Institute. It was purpose built as a research laboratory in 1916. And in 1925, over in that corner of this building, scientists isolated for the first time ever a crystalline pure preparation of a vitamin. It was vitamin B, and they used that preparation to prove Christian Eichmann's theory of micronutrients. And in 1929, Eichmann won the Nobel Prize. We've started working with the scientists in this building in 2008. What does that history mean for the people who work here? Oh, it means a great deal. A culture of scientific excellence is built on a tradition of history of achievement in science. It inspires everybody who works here, including me. And that is still going on? Absolutely, it is. And not just here. I want to show you another amazing place, right over there. The medical faculty in this building can trace its origins back to 1858. The building itself dates to 1922. This is the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Indonesia. You can see the history in this facade, but look at the buildings behind it. Those towers are Emeri, the Indonesia Medical Education and Research Institute. Those buildings embody the ambition of that faculty for their future in biomedical research. So where are we right now? This is the Universities of Indonesia and Oxford Clinical Research Laboratory. We've been collaborating with this faculty since 2008, the very beginning. But in 2017, we opened this facility to support our many 
mutually collaborative clinical trials together. So let's have a look. Hi, my name is Arif Arial Sam. I'm professor of internal medicine and I was currently appointed as the Dean of Faculty of Medicine just in Indonesia for the second term. Hello, Dean Ari. Can you tell me more about the collaboration? With collaborations, our students can participate in OCRU research projects. It is very important experience for them for their career in the future. Yes, and, and not just a OCRU, but the entire system. We have a very large hospital full of patients. We have an energized medical faculty. We have bright medical students and a superb research facility. That's the system I'm referring to, and that's the future of medical research in Indonesia. It's in one location, synergies for everybody there, including, importantly, the patients. How does this amazing synergy get reflected across the whole of Oku? Well, b before COVID, we did visit each other and we understood how each of us worked, but we worked differently because of the different problems and settings each of us faced. But with COVID, we were forced to deal with the same infectious disease together at the same time. Yeah, it was a great opportunity for us to sync up. We found new ways to work with each other more efficiently. We were able to shift resources, money, reagents, people, to where they were needed when they were needed. So basically, it drove a point home. We are located in the two Southeast Asian countries with the largest and most diverse populations, with Nepal working the South Asian region. If we can address questions in these populations, then we can certainly address questions across the whole of Asia. So I hope you enjoyed that whistle-stop tour around our units in Ho Chi Minh City in Hanoi and in Jakarta. Um, so together, we work very, very closely together and we have an overall vision and OCRU's vision is to have local, regional and global impact on health by leading a locally led research program on infectious diseases across Southeast Asia. So as mentioned in the video, we have two units in Vietnam. I'm sitting at OCRU in Ho Chi Minh City today. And our site in Ho Chi Minh City is at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, the referral hospital for all infectious diseases in Southern Vietnam. We sit in a large clinical laboratory building, which was exclusively, exclusively funded by the Vietnamese government. We have 316 staff and collaborators in total working here on this site. But we don't just work in HTD. We also work and collaborate with many other hospitals as well as universities in the south of the country. In the north, in Hanoi, Okru is based in the National Hospital for Tropical Diseases, an adult infectious disease hospital that treats over 4,000 patients every year. Okru Hanoi is slightly smaller unit in the north with 53 staff members. And in the north, we also collaborate with a number of other institutes, in particular with the National Institute for Hygiene and Epidemiology. In Jakarta, we are now hosted by the University of Indonesia at FKUA, as you saw in the video. And in Jakarta, at Okru, Indonesia, our focus is on bench to bedside research, which is aiming to improve health for the people in the country. We also have a unit in Kathmandu in Nepal, where we are hosted by Patan Hospital and the Patan Academy of Health Sciences. And here we focus on healthcare priorities in Nepal. The research conducted across all of our units is incredibly diverse. It covers a range of pathogens, everything from COVID-19, obviously mentioned in the video, to malaria, dengue, tuberculosis, and you'll hear many and um, much more information in our research group talks coming up soon. Antibiotic resistance is now one of the key concerns. Um, it was highlighted by the WHO recently. We do a, a lot of work in that area. And we do work in, on these pathogens and in these areas using a number of diverse disciplines. So we've been working on clinical trials for many years. Within the laboratory, we work on um, 
numerous disciplines covering genetics, microbiology, et cetera. And at the computer, we're also using biostatistics, mathematical modeling, health economics, a lot of rich research going on in those areas. We also have research conducted in social and implementation science, public engagement, and on medical innovations. And you will hear more about that very soon. The whole reason many of you are joining today is to hear about our PhD studentships. So every year, OCRU offers opportunities for Vietnamese and Indonesian students and clinicians to enroll in a four-year training programme at our units. Successful applicants are registered at UK universities. We have strong partnerships with Oxford University as well as the Open University in the UK. And while applicants are registered at these universities, the research work they carry out is mainly conducted at our Okru offices in either Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi, or Okru, Indonesia. All of our research during these PhD studentships focus on infectious diseases and um, public health relevant to Okru and the Southeast Asia region. These fellowships um, are very valuable and I strongly recommend that you apply for them because they include supervision and training. They include tuition fees, support for overseas training and attendance to conferences and a stipend or salary. Okra PhD programme has been running formally since the year 2000. We now have 132 PhDs graduated across our units. And at this current time, we have 34 PhD students in process. We celebrate the achievements of these students regularly at our PhD celebration parties. And you can see some really nice photos of our graduating students here. Throughout the PhD training programme, OCRU supports the development of students, not just to conduct their research, but also to enhance their practical skills through a number of training workshops on a diverse range of topics, including things like biostatistics and qualitative research. And aside from research skills, we also conduct training courses to develop the transferable skills of our students. And these are really critical to becoming a competitive and successful um, researcher. Such skills include scientific writing, time and project management, and how to present your work. We also host careers events and we encourage our students to take part in a number of public engagement activities. Every year we host a student conference in collaboration with our sister unit in Thailand, which is Moru. And this student conference includes a lot of training. It also allows our students to network with their PhD cohort across the region. And we also conduct a three minute thesis competition every year. If you are interested in applying for a PhD at OCRU, you can find out more on our website, but here you can see the main details. To be eligible for this programme, you must have a high level degree in a related subject or be a qualified medical doctor. You must have an English score of at least IELTS 7. You can find out about the projects we are advertising each year from September onwards. And these projects are advertised through our partners at the University of Oxford on the Nuffield Department of Medicine website. So after these are advertised in September, the timeline is as such. Application deadline will be the start of December. Interviews for these projects will be conducted in January and February of next year. And this means that if you're successful, the earliest start date for your studies is April 2025, or you can roll a little, a little bit later at, in October. These projects are all registered either at the University of Oxford or Open University. The research projects are normally full time, but we can discuss part time options and your project must be completed within four years if conducted full time. We cover salary and research costs. If you are interested or require more details, you can go to our website or contact us on training at okru.org.
But what if you have an amazing idea for your own project? You come with your own ideas. You do not want to apply for an already advertised project. Well, we encourage this too. You can identify a potential OCRU supervisor in your area of interest. You can simply check out our website at www.okru.org. We encourage you to contact them directly or you can email us at our training email and we can connect them with you. We recommend that if you do have a great idea for your project to prepare a short project proposal, obviously remembering that our research expertise is focused on improving human health in Southeast Asia. You should have clear aims and objectives. You may wish to consider deliverables and outcomes. And what is really important is that you should clarify the gap that you are trying to fill. You should also provide an up-to-date CV to your targeted supervisor, outlining your qualifications, your expertise, your transferable skills. And of course, don't forget to include a cover letter. Now, if you wish to go through this route, but still be considered for our fully funded studentships, do note that your project will still need to go through a competitive recruitment process if you wish to be considered for this. So our PhD programme really is a huge part of our scientific capacity building efforts. On this slide, you can see a number of our graduates who have gone on to conduct work as postdoctoral researchers. Some have gone on to industry or continued to work in clinics. Others have gone to local universities to become lecturers, or maybe they've even started up their own research group. So our PhDs follow a number of paths to success. At this stage, I would like to thank you for your attention. And do remember that if you have any questions, do navigate to the chat box. Okay. And now I'm going to hand over to our research groups. We have a number of research groups ready to give you a flavor of their research. And I hope that the speakers for each of our research groups are ready and ready to go and give you some information. First up, we're going to start with Okru Hanoi. So I'd like to invite uh, Professor Rokir, our director. Thank you, Lee. Um, I think the video you saw earlier, I was speaking from my own home while I was isolating at home with COVID. I'm now speaking to you from my office in much better state. Um, this is a picture of uh, of our group. As was mentioned earlier already, we are a group of, uh, of 53 people, research staff, research support staff, and we do a wide spectrum of research from laboratory work to policy engagement. Next slide, please. So we're in Hanoi. Um, in the National Hospital for Tropical Diseases and in the National Institute of Hygiene and Epidemiology. We also work closely with Hanoi Medical University. And because we are in Hanoi, we also engage with the Ministry of Health and try to get them involved in some of our larger projects. Um, we were established in 2006 at the time um, to work on the pandemic of H5N1 that people feared was going to happen. That has been quiet for a while, but if you follow the news a bit, you may have seen that um, this is again something that the world is, is worrying about. Um, anyway, we do not work on that at the moment, but we may in the future. Most of our work um, is around antimicrobial resistance. Next slide, please. So we have a faculty of 11 people. We have four principal investigators and the main topics we work on are surveillance in a global project to improve the surveillance of antimicrobial resistance by adding both clinical data and genomics data. We have a line of research on community interventions on AMR to try to bring down antibiotic use in the community to offer people alternatives of going to the pharmacy for getting their antibiotics, for instance, with diagnostic tests or with educational interventions. That's led by Dr. Sonia Lewica on the top left. Dr. Hoon, next to Sonia's picture, is leading a program on antimicrobial stewardship, doing research on seeing which parts of antimicrobial stewardship programs work best in Vietnamese hospitals to bring down antibiotic prescription and use. 
And then Thomas Kesterman, whom you've seen before in the video, is working on laboratory solutions for AMR. Many hospitals in Vietnam do not have laboratories to diagnose resistance in bacteria that cause infections, but the doctors there do prescribe antibiotics and we try to give them a way to diagnose what they should prescribe first before they do so. And that's a very, very brief summary of the work in El Cru Hanoi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rakir, for that whistle stop tour of Hanoi. And moving swiftly on to our next research group, I'd like to welcome um, a representative from the Emerging Infections team. Good, uh, good, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Chochu from the Emerging Infections group, and it is my honor to speak uh, to be the speaker of my group again this year, our crew. Uh, my main job has remained the same with carrying out uh, the uh, nu nucleic extraction from the samples and the diagnostic uh, real-time PCR on those samples. And occasionally, I carry out uh, the genomic sequencing to uh, discover the known and unknown emerging pathogens. Um, but that's all about my stuff. And now, uh, moving on to uh, introducing you to my work amazing and enthusiastic group. We are a very diverse and multidisciplinary group with uh, people coming from different backgrounds such as clinical and laboratory carrying out studies that uh, from bench to bedside and back. Uh, so uh, as you can see that um, as you can see here listed here is the uh, desert, uh, diseases and research themes that are, are carrying out at the moment in group. Uh, some examples to show that uh, we collaborate with not only the National Institute, but also with the international research units as well. So uh, for example, we uh, investigate on the etiological agents which causing the community acquired pneumonia. And that project is sponsored by the uh, prepare program of the uh, of the Singapore National or a uh, photo showing a big consortium for the sequel variants, uh, which is uh, focusing on the uh, biological significance of the SARS-CoV-2 variants, uh, and we collaborate with uh, scientists from Singapore, the UK, Thailand, and Indonesia. And uh, we also had some of our Bradley representative uh, research capacities showing here and the outputs. So uh, for example, we have the Illumina Next Generation Sequencing, which we use to investigate the uh, evolution of the monkeypox in 2022. And we discovered the, the emerging sublineage A2.2.1 or uh, the vital sign monitoring wearable device uh, as part of our innovation projects for the clinical research. Uh, all, the, all the rest of the immunological platforms to look at the antibody and T-cell responses. And we hope that we can expand our research on not only uh, on toes mentioned pathogens, but also to other emerging pathogens. And we hope that with all the trial studies we carry right now, we have to improve diagnosis and patient management to leverage existing capacity and, and also to addressing the unprecedented challenges of emerging infections in order to cope with a future outbreak scenario. And that's all of my talk. And thank you for your listening. And if you have any questions, just leave it in the chat box. I will answer shortly. Thank you so much, Chow Tro. Very nice talk and lots going on in the Emerging Infections Group. Okay, next up we have the Tuberculosis Group with Dr. Lahom Van. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dr. Lahom Van and I'm the uh, clinician uh, team lead in the Tuberculosis Research Group. Um, so before sharing with you what we're doing in TB group or tuberculosis group, um, I would like to uh, tell a story about how humans 
fighting with um, tuberculosis. So do you know that tuberculosis is actually much older than humans being? And it is estimated that maybe 150 million years, the genus of uh, mycobacterium has been existed in, in the earth. So this disease is very, very old. And does it still exist now? So we can see that even before humans even exist in this world, this bacteria already exists and it is still until today. And uh, even though we uh, have the treatment for tuberculosis, the disease caused by this bacteria, uh, until now more than 10 million people get the disease every year. And this is still one of the most killers of infectious disease in the world. So each year, more than 1.5 million people died of tuberculosis. So TB group uh, in our career is now in the fight with that disease. So what we are doing right now is we have researches in diagnosis to improve the diagnosis for, for patient. And we're trying to find a new treatment for patient but in order to get into that, we have to understand about the bacteria and understand about the body, how our body reacts to the disease, and therefore we can prevent the disease. So going back to the group, so right now we have more than uh, 54 members. So we split our groups into six different teams. So I'm in the uh, clinical team and uh, together we have uh, my microbiology team, we have molecular team, we have data team where uh, a lot of um, scientists uh, with background in mathematics and uh, biostatistic or um, bioinformaticians will analyze on the data. And we also have the um, uh, TB meningitis uh, in children group and then another group is um, molecular uh, epidemiology. So we are a, quite a large group, but very young group at the same time. So we are foster a paid forward culture. Uh, so in, in this our group, we try to um, create an environment that people can thrive. So we welcome any um, any PhD student who's interested in doing research in TB. And together we can uh, continue the fight with this disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Van. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Okay, next up, we have the malaria group. So from malaria, we should have Van Nguyen Hong, Hong Tu. Hello, could you could you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, I can. Oh, thank you, Liv. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thu, and I'm working as a research assistant in Malaria Group. I'm happy to be here to share about our work. Firstly, do you believe small bites can be a big threat? Yeah, a single mosquito bite can lead to serious illness or even death. Malaria, star, malaria case start in humans with a bite from certain kind of infected female anopheles mosquito, cause a variety of symptoms or even death. So avoiding mosquito bite will reduce malaria transmission. Malaria has been with human population for thousands of years. It has been still a serious global health. In 2022, it was estimated 219 million malaria cases and 608,000 deaths in, 30, in 85 endemic countries in Iria. 30 years ago, Vietnam recorded over 1 million cases of malaria each year. Last year, 2023, the number of malaria cases were 448 with one death. We aim to eliminate malaria, but there are still many challenges and difficulties, including drug resistance, climate change, and fractional health system. To achieve the goals of zero malaria, 
our work focus on the role of clinical trials, synergic epidemiology, and drug-resistant monitoring. Conducting clinical trials have us in determining the most effecting, effective intervention to control and prevent. There are three key components of monitoring system, such as genetic maker, in vivo trials, and in vitro assays. Synthetic maker help us to detect resistance. In vivo trial help us to measure the rate of treatment success. And in vitro assay help to evaluate the group sensitivity. And our work keeps on our focus on reaching the remotest community. We are a multidisciplinary team with vision and researcher at different stage of career. Our aim is to conduct high quality malaria research. So if you are interested in our project, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tu. Really nice talk. And moving from one malaria um, spread disease to another, um, I would like to invite Dr. Nguyen Min Nguyen from the Dengue team. Thank you, Lee. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Nguyen, a clinical research fellow of um, Dengue Group at Okro, Vietnam. Uh, today, I'm pleased to join this event and introduce you briefly about our research group. So um, dengue is a very common viral disease in Vietnam with hundreds of thousands of dengue patients presenting at the hospital annually, leading to a huge burden to the healthcare setting and the economy of our country. However, there is currently no specific treatment for dengue, whereas the, the current available vaccine uh, have shown limited efficacy. Uh, the current treatment strategy for dengue patients are mainly the supportive care with the close monitor um, and careful um, management of the fluid intake. Our studies aim to uh, better understand how the virus could invade our body, uh, the signs and the symptoms that the patient may experience and uh, how our body could react to the viruses. The knowledge gained from this study could support us to um, early identify the patient who would potentially progress to the severe disease so that the doctor could provide the appropriate treatment, uh, develop the tools to, um, uh, to closely monitor the patient without causing any uh, inconvenience uh, or conduct the, the interventional trials to find out um, the safe uh, drug to fight against this disease um, and also reduce its impact on the uh, community. In addition, we also working on the, uh, how to um, forecast the dengue outbreak um, in Vietnam in the near future using the information related to the climate. Um, the number of dengue patients reported annually, uh, the viruses and um, the mosquito population in nature. Uh, this tool will help us uh, predict uh, when and where the outbreak would occur, uh, how big the outbreak would be, so that we could uh, perform different um, prevention activities to reduce the number of dengue cases in the communities. Um, so for more information, uh, about our group and our research, you can scan the QR code or email us um, via the emails given in, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and we also welcome everyone who uh, who are interested in dengue research group. Uh, so thank you for, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nguyen. And next up, we have the Zoonosis team, and our presenter is Dr. Nguyen Vinh Chung. Yeah, thank you, Lee, for the uh, present uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Chung, and I'm a postdoctoral scientist in the Zoonosis group. So I'm very happy today to share with you about oh. our group and our. So we all know that human and animal are living closely 
Therefore, it's very uh, crucial uh, to study zoonosis. But what is zoonosis diseases? So zoonotic disease are disease that could spread between animals and human. And about 60% of infectious diseases that are reported globally are zoonotic origin. And about 70% of emerging infectious diseases which cause disease in human are or originated from the animals. So in the zoonosis group, we include a member with various different uh, background, including uh, medicine, pharmacy, biology, uh, microbiology, and uh, last but not least, veterinary medicine. So we work together on the uh, three main uh, research team, as you see from the slide. The first one were, um, uh, is the antibiotic resistant. Uh, secondly, we also work on the um, uh, strep Swiss infection. And last but not least is the uh, strep pneumonia uh, diseases. So for those teams, we're using the combination of uh, microbiology and uh, bioinformatics to study the abundance of the disease in the community. We also having our PhD project, which will be advertised very soon, as Lee mentioned, it could be uh, September or December this year. And we will employ whole genome sequencing to study pneumococcal infection in children in Vietnam. And we all know that uh, strep pneumonia could cause a severe infection in uh, children, including in the uh, central nervous system, bloodstream or the respiratory tract. And we will study um, uh, those population and investigate the virulence of vaccine and non-vaccine type strep pneumonia in association with uh, the clinical presentation in the disease population of children. So if you're interested in our uh, project, please keep an eye on the advertisement and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chum. Very thank you for joining us from the UK. So thank you for joining us. Next, Next up, up, we have a team, Dr. Zhu Hongduk. Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhu Hongduk. I'm a postdoc a scientist at the Biostatistics Group, a crew based in Ho Chi Minh City. So it's my pleasure today to uh, give to you uh, a brief overview, overview of our, what we are doing at uh, this moment at Oak Group and what we can contribute to uh, efficient DC health medical research in uh, general. So uh, biostatistics is a uh, research field focused on the analysis and interpretation of the data that we can collect through different living organisms and at Oak Group we mostly focus on the humans. Uh, so our uh, groups uh, currently have five members so you can recognize in the uh, photos here so our group heads uh, rono in the middle uh, next to rono to the left in pink shirts is james a senior statistician uh, me uh, in the uh, white shirt here and we have the two PhD students about to uh, finalize and graduate uh, that, uh, soon so uh our main roles at the cruise, uh, including uh, uh, first supporting, that we provide advice and support the uh, statistical analysis uh, in general, and we uh, supervise uh, PhD students. Uh, we also provide trainings uh, to build capacity through different like uh, statistical uh, topic methods uh, via uh, course or seminars uh, annually, and we also uh, do our own research. Uh, to develop the uh, uh, novel statistical methodology in areas relevant to approve. And talking about uh, research, we involve in different uh, stages uh, of uh, carrying our research and work uh, uh, closely with uh, 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 most of the uh, our uh, other groups as well, uh, involving in the uh, uh, study designs, uh, determine sample size, uh, and also did our uh, analysis and study uh, report. So over the last few years, uh, we uh, focus on a different research topic and some of the remarkable one is uh, uh, prediction models for diagnosis and uh, prognosis, uh, focusing on tuberculosis, uh, tetanus, dengue, uh, COVID-19, etc. 
and you know, uh, so uh, try to improve the design analysis of uh, different clinical trials and uh, observational studies. And over the last uh, pandemic uh, in Vietnam uh, and in the world for the uh, COVID-2, we work uh, close over, uh, closely uh, with the uh, Department of Health and uh, how to uh, identify some of the uh, key <coughs> areas for develop the uh, policy and uh, involving the estimation time of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, on the symptom onset, like incubation time uh, as well. So uh, looking forward to uh, seeing uh, you and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. And next up, so we, we have, have Mark, Mark the, head the head of, of mathematical modeling. Yeah, keep running. Yes, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, I guess. Um, yes, um, I am the head of mathematical modeling at OKU. We are a group of nine people. So um, in, in addition to myself, uh, we've got one postdoc, two PhD students, uh, two research assistants, and four additional students. And uh, we work mostly um, on topics related to public health, uh, as I show on that figure on the left-hand side where uh, we want essentially to do prevention and control and we do as much as possible try to forecast uh, what the next outbreak will uh, look like and when it's going to happen in order to improve uh, prevention and control. So this is really what we want to do and to do so as the name of our group uh, implies uh, we use uh, mathematics and computer in order to uh, first better understand um, the epidemiological system and then take um, use those uh, models as uh, tools for decision making. Um, so here I'm showing a few uh, uh, examples of what the model looks like in the field of epidemiology with some mathematical equations and uh, more and more of those models are not necessarily solved mathematically, but we use computers. So we do a lot of computer programming as well to solve these equations. So in the group, we work mostly on dengue fever, uh, but also on other infectious diseases such as influenza and vaccine preventable disease uh, in particular uh, measles, which is also still um, a big problem in Vietnam. And we work closely uh, with the um, public health uh, institutions in Vietnam, both national ones and also provincial ones, in order to provide um, uh, expertise and tools to help those people to take more informed decisions uh, regarding um, the control and prevention of infectious disease. Um, yeah, I, I could end by saying that our staff comes with a background either in computer science or mathematics or um, in um, medicine or preventive medicines. So we will have people more on the technical sites, more interested in learning more on the applications and vice versa people coming from health science and interested in learning more in the technical aspects of modeling. Thank, Thank you very much, much Mark. Mark. And, and next, next up, up, we have our molecular epidemiology team. So, so I'd I like to welcome um, Miss Quinn, who is actually one of our newest PhD students due to start her studies in October this year. Hi, thank you, Lee. Um, so good good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Quinn, and I'm a resource assistant here in the uh, molecular epidemiology group for around five years. And yeah, by the end of this year, I'm going to become a business student here as well. So I'm really excited to be here today and sharing with you all about my amazing teams. So basically we have around 20 people here with a very wide range of expertise and 
Our main focus, as you can tell here with the two pictures from the top left, we strongly interested in the gram-negative pathogens causing uh, multiple infections in humans, such as E. coli, Sigilla, and especially Klebsiella, a key pathogen of our focus right now. And besides that, we also um, focus on developing the workflow for analyzing the metagenomics data, tries to um, perform some deep investigation on how the antibiotics can affect to the human gut microbiome. And so what exactly the molecular epidemiology? In short, the um, model B is mean that you investigate the distribution, the transmissions of the disease in the populations and uh, processes at the molecular level. An example like here, you can see with the uh, combinations of the clinical data that collect from patients like gender or the treatment outcomes and the genomic data that we extract from the bacteria, we can clearly see the big picture of the uh, transmission group. Like we found the bacteria can directly be transferred from one patient to another, or maybe from the environment to the patient as well. And on the other hand, we can also detect and respond rapidly to any outbreak that strongly relates to the treatment failure as well. So what are the factors driving the uh, evolution of bacteria, especially the antimicrobial resistant bacteria, a very hot topic in the world? And what are the mechanisms of uh, antibiotic resistance in gram-negative bacteria? And how does the antibiotic resistant genes here spread across between different uh, bacteria? And by answering those questions at the molecular level, our group can understand the effects of the antibiotic resistant mutations or plasmid structure, in the context of Vietnam or the low middle income country as well. And hopefully that these information can help us to predict the evolutionary trajectory of the uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And uh, with a wide range of a good collaboration with many labs in the world. So whenever you become a member in our group, I believe that we are able to train and share with you all of the essential and professional skills listing here, including the lab technique and also the bioinformatics skill as well. So if you're interested in our work and want to join with us or you just simply have any questions about our group, please feel free to contact me through my email or my Twitter account, or you can directly contact to our group head, Dr. Yui, for more information. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best of luck when with your PhD studies. Okay, next up we have our social science and implementation research group, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Hai. Thanks, Liz, and hi, everyone. Welcome to the Social Science and Implementation Research Group, and my name is Hai, and on behalf of my team, I will give you an overview of our work. First, let me tell you a story of Miss Ming, a 45-year-old lady in Kentucky. She's selling vegetables in the market as a job and diagnosed with hepatitis C in 2010, but she had never had it properly treated due to the unaffordable treatment costs. She visits the Hospital of Tropical Disease in Ho Chi Minh City every three months in the last 10 years to receive the liver supplements to maintain her condition. In our study, Ms. Ming tells the story of many other patients who overcome everyday challenges from treatment costs to lengthy travel to seek care while suffering discrimination because of having an infectious disease. Contact center study allow us to understand those challenges that prevent patients access to care as well as their motivation and opportunities, especially of those living in poverty and marginalization, to firstly, give them a chance to speak out and ultimately to alleviate those obstacles on the journey and ensure equal access to healthcare. In the next month, we will start a new project in the north of Vietnam, looking at hep C treatment with methadone users in primary healthcare to explore the pathway to care of hep C patients with HIV. As a research institution, APRO also pays much attention to conducting our research ethically, and we are collaborating with the Global Health Bioethics Network to conduct research exploring ethical experts of clinical trials. We are finishing up a five-year study looking at perception of different stakeholders about human challenge research. We will also collaborate with the clinical trial unit to do a social science study to improve trial conduct. Lastly, we also have applied study to evaluate the implementation of new innovation in healthcare settings. In the first phase of our collaboration with the Emerging Infection Team, we conducted study to provide the social technical context of the ICU and evaluate the current policy and technological landscape 
in order to inform the implementation of digital innovation in the ICU. We have recently developed a new project to understand the stakeholders' perception and attitudes of applying an early warning system for dengue. Last but not least, if our serious work is not attractive enough, I would have to say that our group has the best snack corner in Akro and is a fun and lovely team. We hope to welcome you here in the unit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hi, and I will definitely come down and test out that theory that you have the best snack corner in Oak Crew. Um, okay, so next up, we're going to pass over to uh, Tan from the public engagement team, who is sitting right next to me. So I'm just going to turn the screen around and Tan can give his presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. And um, hello, everyone. My name is Tan from uh, Public and Community Engagement Group. And um, I think first of all, what is engagement? So engagement is a two-way process that brings scientists and non-scientists together for interaction and listening. We go on to generate the mutual benefits. Mutual benefit means uh, the interaction and the work of engagement must create values to both sides, scientists and non-scientists. Yeah. And approve, uh, we put engagement across the work of our research and science. So we work very closely with communities where our research are taking place. We engage the public and we engage the researchers in order to promote the conversations and partnerships that aim to make our research more locally, locally relevant and accessible, and also to bring science closer to the public. And how do we achieve, how do we achieve our aim? So we have identified um, a diverse groups of key stakeholders to work with, including community members, health researchers, healthcare workers, and young people. And, and from that, we set out like, goals for engagement for each of these specific groups. Um, for example, we design enabling platforms uh, for community members to, to be able to give their views and their real life experiences into the work of our group. So we have been running a health research advisory group for years, and members of this group uh, are teachers, uh, retiree, uh, yoga right, teachers, educators, and so on. Like, uh, um, the people from like, um, and unskilled uh, work. And so they are invited to approve for conservation meetings where they listen to our researchers to present their research ideas and their concerns. And then they join to find my like, collective solution that aim to strengthen the designs and the progress, the implementation of our studies. Yeah. And, uh, and approve, uh, we also offer kind of like talking engagement sessions and seek grants uh, with um, allow our researchers to to be, to be able to like to uh, to think their ideas and to apply for the ideas of engagement activities that are relevant and benefit uh, to their studies. Yeah, and um, we have a, we have a dedicated team who works very closely with hospitals and external partners in designing and offering series of training workshops that aims to strengthen healthcare worker skills in order to better communicate with patients and patient families. And on one hand, we encourage and we de like design those initiatives that aim to promote my science literacy for young my people. And on the other side, we see young people as our, as our partner, which we support their capacity and we empower them to take science at the way in order to design their own engagement, like initiatives to um, like bring it like initiative in order to improve health, um, health outcomes in their communities. So um, monitoring and evaluations, this is also a very important essential piece of work in our work uh, by like, documenting and writing up, we are able to, um, to monitor the progress, to measure the effectiveness, and also to be able to recognize like, those areas for improvement. And we are very open, very keen to share our experiences and good practice to wider communities. So let's kind of play an overall 
and our view of public and community engagement. So um, thank you very much and welcome uh, to join our team, a very dynamic and creative team at Oklo. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Thank you very much, Tan. Um, okay, and last but not least, I would like to invite um, Dang Chong Tuan from the Clinical Trials Unit. Hi, um, hi everyone. I'm Tong. Thanks for your very much introduction, Lee. I'm a research operation manager, and I lead the team to support all the research group to manage a number of important research projects in Okru. So today I'm presenting this uh, sessions focused on what we are doing in the Okru clinical trial unit we call the CTU. Uh, first established in 2006, the CTU network now included a CTU space in Ho Chi Minh City, which is led by uh, Dr. Evelyn and other satellite centers in Hanoi, uh, Nepal, and Indonesia. You can see uh, our team photo from uh, four sides. Uh, this network allows for standardizing the policy and procedures in trial management, uh, which bring efficiencies, especially when uh, we are core enrolling uh, on collaborative uh, clinical trials. Over the past uh, 15 years, uh, the CTU has worked to increase the resource quality and capacity by uh, building the human resources, facilities, oversight, and administrative system uh, necessary for conducting an even growing number of clinical trials. You can see the flowchart describe every process that CTU involved in every step of conducting clinical research uh, from planning, setup, conduct, analysis, reporting, and publication. Taking in advantage, CTU have to make sure the process are uh, uh, as smooth as possible. And over the period from 2010 to 2023, the number of team members had doubled, but the number of trials has increased nearly 10 times with more complicated and variable tri uh, trial and designs. It means beside the pressure of high volume of work, we have to make sure the staff maximize, uh, maximize uh, their capacities to cover uh, all work that we have to manage. And uh, until now, we have uh, successfully conducted 289 clinical studies and over 61 uh, clinical trials. Besides, we also work with the MOH to develop the Vietnamese uh, clinical trial legislation and recently, we support the Vietnam MOS to conduct a project to develop, develop a new tool to assess clinical research site capacity, uh, which has become the main reference for establishing the CTU in uh, Vietnam. And the results of, the, of that project were published in BGM. And furthermore, uh, the CTU not only expanded internally, but through our collaboration, and training, uh, we expanded uh, our relation uh, to um, we expanded our uh, network to uh, re regionally and internationally as well. We have close academic and scientific partnership, and we usually support uh, the other uh, research uh, unit or other institution to develop uh, develop their capacity. We also uh, conduct training and uh, infrastructure uh, capacity to uh, improve their staff. And whenever they have like um, uh, any requirement, they will send uh, the staff to our team. Then we, we will make a plan to train for them. And uh, besides, we also provide training and mentorship to support a new clinical research team uh, around the world. And recently, we also support for the UMP to, to train for the team there. And uh, sharing the Okru CTU model and procedure across the collaborator uh, CTUs. So this is my introduction about the background and uh, organization of the CTU. I would like to hand it back to Lee to continue the program. If you have any questions, please let me know. I hopefully we'll have a chance to work together in the future. Thank you. And thank you very much from the clinical trials team for rounding up our group introductions. I'm sure you've all learned a lot. That was a lot of information. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to have a think about which of the research group, groups that you've heard from are, do you find most interesting? So I'm just going to...
stop sharing for a moment. We're going to have a little bit of fun and move to Slido. So do have a think about what your favourite talk was, which of these groups do you find most interesting? In the meantime, if you continue to have questions, do share in the chat box. I see the chat box being very, very busy. Um, if Ian hasn't got to answer your question yet, I'm sure she will soon. So just give me a second and I'm going to navigate to Slido. Okay, so on your screen, you should be able to see our Slido poll. So in order to vote for the research groups that you find most interesting, you can either go to slido.com and put in this number, 4128177, or you can scan the QR code that you see on your screen. And I see that people are voting already. So first person in voting for Hanoi and emerging infections. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to vote. Let's see who our favourites are. Do you keep voting? Hanoi is very popular this year. Interesting. It looks like Rokir and his team are going to be very busy with applications. We've currently got a four-way tie. Nope. Emerging infections has just pulled into the lead. Four-way tie. Nope. Three-way tie. EI, social science, molecular epidemiology, clinical trials unit. Okay. Time to catch up. Malaria, dengue, and PE. Things changing very quickly here. Okay, I'm going to set a timer for one more minute to vote. Okay, you have one more minute left to vote. Clinical Trials Unit proving very popular this year as well. And it's lovely to see a total of 204 people on this call. So thank you all for joining us today. You have 20 seconds left to vote. We're having a late push from CTU. Okay, and the time is up. I wonder how I close this poll. <laughs> okay, we're going to stop there. All right, so it looks like the Clinical Trials Unit has won this year. So congratulations to Clinical Trials. Okay, so let me stop sharing. All right, thank you very much. A little bit of fun. Nice to see you all getting involved. I will pass on that information to our teams. So moving back to the presentation. Um, so we've heard a lot from our research groups and from our different units. And I think it's important to just stop and think for a moment about what else we're trying to do beyond the actual work we're doing in the hospitals, in the labs, at the computer. And Okra is really proud to foster a strong research culture. We're really committed to supporting our students and staff. And I just want to show another short video highlighting the research culture of Okra. Mm -hmm. 
The thing that defines Oakley's culture at the moment is a spirit of endeavor and collaboration that is really unusual. I think that's what people feel when they walk into this building, and that's what we need to maintain. Hey, how are you? Okra has been really successful in terms of developing and growing homegrown scientists. We have a number of graduates through our programmes and Okra staff who have gone on to senior positions in other institutions and in government for example. Our PhD programme at Okra is also incredibly successful. We've graduated over 100 PhD students since we started our programme. And in actual fact, the students at the moment, our student body, um, over 90% of these are actually homegrown. They're local, so being Vietnamese, Indonesian, Nepalese, for example. And that's actually pretty representative of our history of graduating students. So I think through Okru, uh, I receive a lot of things. So I receive training, support from um, a group of supervisors um, in different areas. ACRO particularly pays attention to the development of researchers uh, with support resources that you hardly can find in any other research institutes in the country and also in the region. Over the years, I have received much support through the ACRO program, which allow me to, to have more study, especially in epidemiology during the COVID pandemic and also uh, another research studies. I have been fortunate to be part of the Make Difference program and it has been beneficial for me in so many ways such as uh, developing a successful and productive team, training to be part of the coaching and mentoring SIP for the new students. One of the initiatives that was started is called OWLS and OWLS stands for Okru Women Leaders in Science. We developed that group because we felt that young researchers needed to see strong female role models, female researchers, female leaders, but also they expressed a need to network, to develop their careers. One of the achievements that we're very proud of is the development of a mentorship scheme because we really want to be able to offer our young researchers all the tools they need to develop a successful career in science. We want to support scientists right from the level of BSc through their career pathway to enable them to reach their full potential. I think it's um, the, the support, the environment and the freedom. And I think that we've been so lucky to be funded by Welcome to uh, develop our own scientific career. So our offer also gave me many precious opportunities to do clinical research in Vietnam uh, to become the head of a research group um, to receive two Wellcome Trust Fellowship and have more funding from international networks. Uh, when being a Wellcome Fellow, I have more recognition and credentials in the research field. Uh, I'm becoming more confident in expressing my own research contributions and more confident in reaching out and connecting with uh, prominent researchers in the world. I'm also a recipient of the Wellcome Fellowship and it has uh, brought me to the new level to be an independent scientist. I want to, to train more uh, PhD students, uh, Vietnamese PhD students. Um, I want to you know, inspire them to do uh, science um, that would you know, uh, strengthen the scientific capacity here in Vietnam. I am now trying to pass on what I've received by um, continued training, um, mentoring and creating more opportunities for my students and uh, my group member. So the ultimate objective is to produce scientists from the region who are capable of standing up and doing internationally competitive science. I think my job as a leader is as a catalyst. I am here to try and make things happen. Therefore, uh, the style required for that is one of inclusivity, uh, one of listening, one of transparency, and that's what I endeavor to bring to the program. And I hope that that manifests itself through the, through the program as part of the, the culture that we uh, create here in Oak Creek. I think the research culture that's been uh, cultivated in Oak Creek 
has been very has been very important for its success. There are several key elements. It's it's a, a, a multinational collaboration. It's inquiring. It's flexible. It's reactive. And it's highly effective. And I, I think it's a, a tribute to uh, everyone who's worked in the unit. OCRU is about building future leaders. It doesn't begin and end with PhDs. And I think that's really, really important. It's the transferable aspect of what we're trying to do, as well as encouraging future scientists to look beyond the lab and the clinic into how they can make a difference in their communities. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an even further flavour into what we do. And we're just about to finish um, our formal part of our open day today. But before we go, saving the best to last, we're going to hear from some of our current students um, doing their PhD projects in Oak Crew at the moment. So we have two students who are just about at the end of their first year. I think um, Dr. Hua has just moved into her second year but very early in their studies. So we have Tween from our mathematical modeling team, and then we have Fa from Okru Hanoi. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tween. I'm a PhD student um, in a mathematical modeling group. And um, to, uh, for the next five minutes, I'll tell you about my story, how I got involved in a PhD with Okru. So my background is a bit different from other PhD students. Um, and you'll see why I want to tell you the whole story. So um, in October of 2019, um, I enrolled for a Bachelor of Information Technology at RMIT University of Vietnam. Um, I was trained to be a programmer and a data analyst. Um, at that point, I had no idea what research is and um, if it's even a viable career path. Um, and I was like uh, ready to go for industry work. Um, and on March of 2022, um, which is the last year of my study at RMIT, um, I started a capstone project in collaboration with Okru on a project called DART. Um, my time at RMIT was uneventful um, most of the time until uh, up until that point. Um, but March is when I first heard of Okru, um, what their mission is, what are their goals. And um, this DART project, uh, uh, the goal is to build a, a disease forecasting system. And um, I didn't know at that point, but I was working with my future boss, which is uh, uh, who is Dr. Moshrazi, um presented earlier. Um, and on October of 2022, um, I finished my capstone project and I um, continue my work on DART by um, joining Okru um, as a research assistant in the mathematical modeling group. Um, at a uh, and I yeah I started uh, continuing working on a project at a supporting capacity, um, and on December of 2022, uh, Mark encouraged me to apply for the PhD position within the project within Dart, and um, it was a chance for me to get deeper into research and contribute to both regional and uh, global public health research, and. Um, these four white boxes you see on the last um, point in the timeline there, those are, uh, that is actually my um, CV, my application for the PhD. And as you can see, it's rather short and half of it is white space. <laughs> because when I applied for the PhD, I didn't have any publications, didn't have any um, book chapters. I didn't have a, like an actual job yet. I just got fresh out of university and uh, I went straight into um, applying for a PhD. Um, next slide, please, Lee. So on February of uh, 2023, um, yeah, I received a PhD placement at um, the University of Oxford um, with funding from Okru, um, more specifically from the DARP project. Um, yeah, I think it was one of the happiest moments of my life. Uh, I, I I didn't have much hope, but um yeah, it was still a surprise. Um and on April of 2023, um I officially graduated from RMIT University of Vietnam and two days later, um I officially started my PhD at Okru. And at that point, um I was the youngest PhD student at Okru, and I think until now as well. Um 
And uh, one of the next highlight is in May 2034 when I got to be a, a no crew open day presenter, the biggest thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the, I started in April last year. So I just finished my first year, and um, I'm early in my second year, and um, got some deadlines and milestones to reach. But um, I can tell you a bit about my first year at Okru. Uh, my uh, the first year of my PhD at Okru. So. Um, the research environment, it is very, uh, very dynamic, um, diverse, and fun as well. Um, there are lots of people to learn from. Um, there's so many different fields of healthcare research to learn from. Um, about training, um, all crew training team, uh, who are lovely Lee and Yin here, um, they provide regular relevant um, training at different stages of her PhD. Um, they also have update meetings once every six months, I think. Um, but they're there to always making sure that you're on track and provide um, help or intervention if needed. Um, about mentorship, um, the unit uh, uh, OCRU, um, the unit is filled with experienced researchers who have been through a PhD before and they understand what it's like, uh, what it takes as well. And these mentors will answer all of your questions that you have surrounding your PhD. Um, and you will never feel like you're lost because you have so much support from everyone. Um, traveling. So since starting the PhD, I have traveled more than I've ever did before. And I just came back from a trip um, in Oxford as well, which is very, very nice. Much better weather. <laughs> um, and uh, I got to visit new countries. Um, I got to indulge in new cultures. Um, I got to meet researchers from around the world. And it's also a chance for a vacation overseas, which is not bad. <laughs> and next is networking. And this directly relates to the point above. Um, a large part of your PhD is to meet researchers within your field. And they can end up becoming your supervisor, your advisors, or um, your fellow PhD students. And building a network of peers um, is very important in your research. And OCRU enables that support um, to their fullest capacity. Um, so at the end, I would like to say that um, I hope my story encourage you to try or follow dreams of doing your research, even if you might feel you're unqualified, as you can see, I'm an example. <laughs> and as long as you can show your passion, your determination, um, show um, that you want to do this and um, and um, convince or persuade the interviewers that um, you're able, uh, capable of carrying this out, um, all crew is here to help you, support you to achieve that um, goal of yours. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Twain. A really inspirational story from our PhD baby. Okay, next up, we have Dr. Hua from Okru, Hanoi. Hua, can you please share your story with us? Thanks, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hua. I am excited to be here to share with you about my experience after a year of PhD student of Open University based at Okru, Hanoi. Uh, first of all, let me introduce you about myself. Uh, I gained a medical doctor degree as a general practitioner, and I obtained a specialized certification after I finished a residency program in clinical microbiology at Hanoi Medical University or HMU. Following this, I worked as clinical microbiologist at National Hospital Tropical Disease in Hanoi and later at National Lung Hospital. Additionally, I am an invited lecturer in, at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy, HMU and uh, hospital where I work at, collaborate with our crew on some project. And I have known my main supervisor, Professor Rokia Van Dorn for some years. I keep contact with him for professional consultation and the course PAT opportunity. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, through my work interest and desire to work in an international environment, I started my PhD in Okru with three studies on antimicrobial resistance in hospitals in Vietnam. Now, 
I am in the second year and I look back at my first year and I will never forget the first day I came to Oku Hanoi. I received many emails regarding meeting schedules and I had three meetings with my supervisors and study team. An experience unlike any work day before. Because um, at the time, because st three studies were running, I have to quickly, I had to quickly get up to speed and active engage. Luckily, our crew have many programs to support PAD students like me. Uh, I have I have regular meeting with my supervisors to discuss what I am doing, what I will do, and what I need. I also have a review meeting each six months with Dr. Lee Jones and Miss Ian to ensure I have a clear plan for my PAT and I'm following the milestones. With the mentorship, I have a mentor who is a senior in clinical microbiology. Uh, she gave me some advice for my PAT project and she's the Dr. Hương Lan in ATD Tropical Disease in Ho Chi Minh City. And I also have a buddy who is a PAT student in Oku Hanoi. Uh, additionally, college at Oku Hano supported me in various study activities. I had opportunity to develop skill by attending English class at Oku, participating in the three-minute uh, competition for PhD students, and presenting at academic meeting in Hanoi and Oku. Regarding the training program, I attend some online and on-site course and also overseas course from Oku and Open University. And I traveling, I, I sorry, I travel to a hospital study site for research activity. A significant milestone in my first year was the upgrade procedure. I wrote a report and presented it in a mini viva to, to reviewers who provide valuable feedback to support my PhD studies. All the experience helped me to uh, organize and manage my work. They are like puzzle pieces that together make up the complete list of my first year. And finally, I would like to send you a message. PhD program at Oku offer a remarkable experience. It's like a key to open your academic journey. And you will, you will conduct research with full support from supervisors, training committee, and college. So try to meet the requirement and apply to become a PhD student of AKU. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Juan. I'm so glad that your first year has been so successful. And that brings us to the end. Thank you, Juan. That brings us to the end of our formal presentations. Now, we're going to be online until four o'clock. This is your chance to raise your hand and raise your voice if you would like to ask a question live. I know that Ian has been manning the chat box, so she may also want to raise some of the commonly asked questions um, that I'm happy to answer as well. So while you're thinking about that, I would also like to remind you all to follow us on social media. So we've got a very busy communications team at Oak Crew. We're always sharing about the activities and the work that we're doing. We also share about um, upcoming job opportunities as well as PhD projects. So you can follow us on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter or X as it's now known. If you want to share your thoughts about our Open Day, we encourage you to do so. Do tag us in and do hashtag Okru Open Day. We also wish to gather your feedback on how, whether you found this um, event day useful or is there anything else you think would help in future events. So do scan the QR code and offer your feedback. Otherwise, I open the floor to questions. I've not looked at the chat box yet. So I'm going to open it now um, and see if there's any sort of commonly asked questions that I could answer. So I see that people here are asking about English waivers. So generally we ask for an IELTS score of seven, but if you have conducted your master's degree or your bachelor's um, degree in an English speaking university, you can also request an English waiver or if there's significant evidence that you have been working in 
an academic environment where English is the main um, language, then you could also request a waiver based on that. The waiver is considered by the University of Oxford, first and foremost, so they may ask for additional um, information. But yes, if you do have evidence of a master's or a BSc in English, you absolutely can ask for a waiver. Okay, let me just scroll back. Can I apply for PhD OCRA if you don't have a master's degree? And we do prefer a master's degree or a medical doctor qualification. However, there have been some rare occasions when um, students have been accepted without a master's. Tween, who you heard from today, um, was successful in applying to OCRU um, without a master's. It is an incredibly competitive programme though. So I would say that a master's degree is a great first step if you don't have one. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, some people asking about Moru. So actually I work across the network. So I work for Okru and I also work for Moru, which is our sister unit that covers um, Thailand and a number of other countries in the region. Um, if you wish, you can contact me at Moru um, and I can give you some more information there. We do have PhD opportunities at Moru. Um, these research projects are advertised in the same way as our projects. So you can go onto the NDM website. Um, so it's on exactly the same web page. In October, you will see more projects being posted there. Um, but I will also um, type in student, I think it's student admin at Moru, um, at sorry, trotmed.bc. Um, so you can contact us there. I've just put that in the chat box. You can also navigate to Moru's um, webpage for more information. They have information on their PhD programs there as well. Okay, feel free to keep dropping your messages or if you want to ask a question live, you can unmute as well. So the number of PhD slots, Hello. oh, sorry, yes. Yes, who's talking to me, Siti, is that right? Hello, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, good afternoon everyone from Jakarta, Indonesia. And I would like to introduce myself first in a, in a short time. My name is Siti Nur Hayati, and I've just graduated from master's degree in tropical medicine and infectious disease, which is related to this topic right now. Absolutely. And, uh, I would like to highlight the most important thing in neglected tropical diseases and emerging infectious disease in our country, especially in Asian region. And I've, uh, I've never seen uh, since the first slide presentation from our speakers today that we don't have our researcher here in Akru concerned about HIV and tuberculosis. And uh, I would like to inform that I'm interested about this topic uh, for my PhD program in the future. I'd like to try to apply it. And uh, the second question, uh, is there any possibility if I would like to conduct my research here in Indonesia and collaborate to Vietnam, um, Vietnam or any other uh, of regions uh, for the object of the research itself? That's uh, from, my, from my side and thank you. Very good question. I firstly say to congratulations for graduating. Your research focus is absolutely of interest to us. We did have a talk from our tuberculosis team. The tuberculosis team does conduct clinical trials in Indonesia as well. So that's part of a large collaboration with our Indonesia unit. So we do absolutely have TB research. We also have um, HIV research ongoing in Indonesia as well under um, Dr. Raf Hamers, mm -hmm. who is one of our researchers in Indonesia. So that is a topic of interest. We may be advertising under that topic this year, but even if we're not, what I would recommend is in advance of our advertised projects, which will appear on the NDM website in September, I would highly recommend that you reach out to our researchers at Okru Indonesia 
to um, raise your interest with them and they can already let you know what projects they're intending on advertising this year so you would get a little bit of a head start with the application process or you may have some ideas for your own project mm -hmm. in those research themes and you can suggest them to them mm -hmm. so I think it would be a good idea for you to email those members of staff already and have a chat with them okay thank you thank you very much CT Okay, another new question in the chat box. Can I do a PhD OCRU with my own project? Recently, my team receives a grant for a big project for developing detection infections by applying molecular technology. Yet my current university doesn't have relevant PhD programs for that project. This sounds like a really interesting project though. So we have a big team at OCRU on, um, that work on emerging infections. We also have a number of um, developing detection methodologies across our research groups, applying molecular technology. So that is a that's sort of a cross-cutting theme, I would say. If you were interested in perhaps setting up a collaborative project and you're already working um, in another university, I would recommend that you have a look at our webpage on okra.org and reach out to some of those research teams where you can see some opportunities for um, synergy and collaboration, because it's possible that we could um, enroll you um, in a collaborative project, which means that you could be enrolled either at Oxford or Open University through Oakley. So I would strongly recommend you to reach out, particularly to the Emerging Infections team, um, also to um, our TB team do molecular technologies as well, our molecular epidemiology team. We also do diagnostics in our dengue team and malaria. So across a number of those teams. So have a look online and do reach out to the members of that team for further information. You're very welcome. Okay, um, there's some sorry, yes. Oh, who's who's speaking to me? Um, hi, Lee, and thanks for everyone sharing today. So I would have one question. So currently there are two universities that are affiliated with the OCRU PhD program, which are the Oxford University and the Open University. So um, I would like to ask that when I apply to the OCRU PhD program, so will the OCRU PhD program decide on my behalf that which university that I am going to be allocated to, like they will decide on my behalf or I get to decide which university that I'm going to attend. Um, thank you. A very good question. So as part of our OCRU studentships, these are quite closely tied to tuition fee only funding, which is available from the University of Oxford. Now for the last number of years, um, all of our OCRU studentship um, PhD students, um, all of our successfully funded OCRU PhD students have gone through the Oxford University system. Now, we also have the Open University available should we run out of studentships. Like there is an opportunity for, for example, a student who we thought was very, very good, but wasn't um, that maybe narrowly missed out on a fully funded Oxford um, OCRU PhD studentship, where there could be an opportunity if a research group leader says, hey, I really liked that candidate. Okay, they weren't successful for the OCRU studentships, but I actually have some of my own grant research funding. Could we still enroll them? And at that stage, we could use our open university pathway. OK, so it's it's not quite a clear answer, but what I would say is for the most part, if you obtain one of our fully funded studentships, you will be enrolled through the University of Oxford. If we still think that you are a really good PhD candidate and there is some internal funding in one of our research groups, then we could put you through the Open University uh, pathway. Thank you, Olive. That was a very um, satisfac satisfactory answer. Thank you, Lillian. Okay, so Chandra on the chat has asked, I saw last year that Okra Indonesia 
had a theme linked to access and acceptance of newly introduced vaccines in Indonesia. Is this still available? Um, so the uptake for that project is closed for the moment. However, there is a chance that that may be re-advertised last year. Now, the two research group heads leading that theme is Raf Hamers in Indonesia and Jennifer Van Newell, who is the head of our social science and implementation research group at Oak Crew. So if you would like to find out if that theme is likely to be re-advertised, then I would contact them. Okay, any further questions? You're very welcome, Chandra. Okay, I'm just scrolling back. The number of PhD slots, yes. So this was something I wanted to touch on. So generally speaking, we advertise about 10 projects every year on the Oxford NDM website, and these cover a variety of different disciplines and topics in fitting with the, the talks from the research groups that you've heard today. In terms of available funding and studentships, so we have three fully funded OCRU PhD studentships every year. Okay, now that covers um, tuition fees, um, training money to go overseas, a stipend, um, all of your supervision fees, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all of your university related fees. So that's three will be fully funded every year. And that would cover either projects in Vietnam and projects in Indonesia, right? So there's a total of three. Now there is one additional um, funding scheme that's been made available to Vietnamese students, which is a Sovico PhD fund. Now that is um, eligible for projects where there is a strong collaboration with Oxford in the UK. So those PhD projects, um, which are advertised in exactly the same way on our NDM partner page, the funding for those projects is selected in exactly the same time frame. Okay, so you would just apply to the projects you're interested in. Some of these projects may require some travel to the UK for extended periods. Um, and that would be indicated on that research uh, profile on that page, okay? And it means that they would also be available um, for the Silver Coast scheme, okay? But that's all considered on the same interview schedule. They're all interviewed in the same way. So you don't have to do separate applications. Okay. Any further questions? while I'm scrolling back, or does anyone want to ask another question live? There's another message popped up. Each PhD student does a project individually or is it going to be a group project? Okay, so you would be given your individual project. However, these are normally nested within a larger group project. So say for example, um, there is a project on a clinical trial in TB, for example. That PhD student may not be the one that is the doctor that's running the project, or it may be. Or maybe they're using samples from that clinical trial to do a laboratory project, which means you would have a small part in that larger project, okay? So that's normally how most projects work in Okru, that there's lots of people working on a greater project, but a student has their own ring-fenced part that they're working on individually. But the good part about that is that you're working within a greater team, so there's lots of mentorship, lots of support available. You have that real um, networking aspect of your PhD. Fun, where can I find all of the advertised projects? Well, these will be available on the NDM webpage. I think I would like to ask Ian to copy and paste the link again. At the moment, we don't have a lot of projects up there. And the reason is because our projects are then going to be advertised again 
in September. Okay, so we consider on an annual basis. So you won't see a lot being advertised from all crew there at the moment, but you should keep visiting that web page in September. And at that point, you will see lots of projects beginning to appear. You will have up until December to apply for those projects. It's going to be a 100% research project. Yes, correct. For UK PhDs, we do not have compulsory classes that you need to attend. So it allows you to spend 100% of your time on your project. What we will give you is access to a number of different training, um, training courses. Okay, so those happen throughout the year and you'll be able to join the ones that are relevant to you. Any further questions? Somebody mentioned about social science backgrounds. We do have a social science and implementation research team. We also have social science projects ongoing in our public engagement um, team as well. And the social science team um, closely collaborates with a number of different research teams. So it could be that there's a lot of cross collaborative themes being advertised this year too. Um, digital health was a project that is actually still being advertised. It's one of the few still being advertised on the NDM webpage. And the reason for that is because it's an Indonesia based project. And in Indonesia, there is the opportunity to apply for government studentships. So because that is still ongoing, we've kept that project live for Indonesia. So if you're interested to learn more about that project, you can look at the NDM DFIL project theme webpage. You can also directly contact Dr. Anuraj Shankur, who is based in Okru, Indonesia, and he can give you more information on that project. Okay, let me see, is there any other themes? Um, doo -doo -doo. Does the programme require full-time working in the unit because there is a doctor asking if she can continue working? So we do have a number of cases where um, doctors continue to work at their hospital but conduct their research at Oak Crew. Now we do have to make sure that you're able to dedicate enough time to the project because a PhD project is a really, really big undertaking. It takes a long time. You can you can reach out and ask a number of our clinical doctors who've conducted PhDs at Okru. And we do need to ensure that you will be given adequate time off from your duties to conduct your PhD. The way in which we make that easier is to try and choose um, or to try and encourage you to choose a research programme that closely aligns with some of the work that you already do at the hospital. We would also require your hospital to submit a letter to us and from one of the senior members of staff to show that you will be given adequate time off from your duties. This is just to ensure um, that we aren't enrolling someone who's not going to be allowed to complete that PhD. Okay, so yes, you can, but we will require some assurance that you'll be able to spend time on the PhD. Okay, we have five minutes left remaining online. So if you have any burning questions, do ask them now. Ian, are there any questions that were coming up during the presentations that you might like me to address? For now? For now, I, I, uh, I, I don't see any uh, of that question because a lot, <laughs> like a Locked in, in the chat box, I try to respond as much as I can. Uh, I hope all of you get respond from myself or uh, from Lee's uh, explanation during the question and answer. But if I miss any, please raise your hand or just uh, unmute your mic and ask the question directly. We still have time for that. Okay. Um. I actually just noticed uh, a final question in the chat box. Can you mute Ian so we don't have the echo? Thank you. Ian and I are sitting in the same room, actually. So being able to communicate and we've seen your questions coming up. 
Okay, Doc Pop has asked, which documents do we need to include in the application? Do we need a letter of recommendation? If you go to the Oxford webpage, they're very clear on the application procedure. The application form is all online. So it's kind of like an online CV. So they will ask you to complete that. There are sections on your work experience, your educational experience, your English language proficiency, um, the project that you're applying to, any previous training you've done, lots and lots and lots of different things. The other documents that they ask you to submit alongside that online application form are a cover letter. So that cover letter should indicate the research project and your area of interest and also convince us that you're a good fit for that project. And you will also need to submit at least two letters of recommendation from references. So you will need to speak to maybe your line manager if you're already working in a research project or maybe your master's supervisor if you've done a master's or if you're coming out of a bachelor's, maybe you've done an undergraduate project, or maybe the head of your year can write you a letter of recommendation. But yes, you will need to submit them as well. If you are submitting um, evidence of IELTS, they will ask for your IELTS certification. If you're asking for a waiver, they will ask you to complete details of that in the application form. And of course, you need to upload the certificates of your university education so far. So your bachelor's certificate and your master's certificate. If they aren't in English, please do get them translated and upload the translations. Where can you find all the information and timeline? Um, so we do have information on our OCRU webpage and we will also signpost you to the NDM website and both of those will refer to the timeline. But again, the timeline would be that we would advertise those projects in September that you would have until December, normally December the 1st, to submit your application. The interviews would take place in January or February. The exact dates for that are set by Oxford, so we do not have them yet. So that would be January or February next year if you are shortlisted for interview. If you are successful, you would be informed very shortly after that interview, so within the month. The earliest you could enrol to Oxford would be April 2025. And some people decide to wait until the October 2025. So those would be the two intake dates, okay? So hopefully that covers the timeline. If you are interested in your own project, if you have an idea for your own project, I would recommend that you contact a member of our research teams really soon to start discussing that potential proposal and um, being included in our OCRU studentship applications. Okay, so you could contact them already and start chatting with them. Um, okay, yep, I see that. So someone has mentioned about internship programs. Um, if you're interested in clinical pharmacy, that's not something we really do at OCRU anymore, unfortunately, but if you are interested in some of the other research topics that you heard about today, we do have an intern program. You can find out more about that on our website. Our internships last a maximum of three months, okay? Now, they're very dependent on the availability of our research teams. So if you would like to be considered for an internship, send us an email. In that email, please submit your CV, Please submit a cover letter or some information in the email about the research topics you are interested in. And we would also need a letter from your university, okay, to show that you are a student of good standing. All right. So that's what you would need to submit to us. We cannot guarantee internship places. It's based on how busy that research group is at the time. Okay, so do let us know the dates you would like to be um, considered for, and we will do our very best to connect you with the relevant research groups. Okay, oh, more messages popping up. We are at four o'clock. Um, just some thank you messages, that's fabulous. Um, Indra, welcome from Indonesia. Um, and thank you for joining us today. And um, yeah, 
We're going to finish up there. That does not mean that the question time is over. Just drop us an email at training at okra.org. We look forward to hearing from you. Good luck for those of you who are still carrying out your studies at the moment. We hope to see applications from as many of you as possible. We hope you enjoyed your time with us today. Do feedback with us um, about our open day and do follow us on social media. Thank you, everyone. Bye.